So having heard the latest data about uh, the use of SGLT2 inhibitors and also combination SGLT1, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, for the treatment of type 1 diabetes, has it managed to change my views on the efficacy and safety and potential use of these drugs for, the people, uh, for, the, for people with type 1 diabetes? Let's start by looking at the, the information that we have. We've now got uh, trials for uh, at least three of the SGLT2 inhibitors or the SGLT2, SGLT1 combinations, if we count sotagliflozin, uh, with data going out to 52 weeks for some of the drugs. And, and basically what this uh, shows is that uh, when you add an SGLT2 inhibitor treatment with, for patients with type 1 diabetes, uh, we see reductions in HbO1c between about 0.3 and 0.4 percent, which are in some cases somewhat attenuated uh, with a longer term treatment. We also see benefits on body weight of around 2 to 3 kilograms body weight loss, which is consistent with what we've seen in type 2 diabetes. Uh, furthermore, we see reductions in insulin dose of around about 10 percent, about 8 units or so uh, for most of these trials. So these are obviously clear benefits uh, for people with type 1 diabetes. The question then arises about the risk-benefit ratio because the main concern here relates to diabetic ketoacidosis. And we understand now that the mechanisms by which these drugs induce ketoacidosis because of their reduction in glycosuria, they shift metabolism towards lipolysis and therefore an increase in ketone body production in the liver. And then it doesn't take very much an infection, uh, a, a missed meal with a missed insulin dose, uh, perhaps compounded by alcohol use, to tip a patient into DKA. And we know DKA is quite common in people with type 1 diabetes, background rates of around 5%. And in these trials, we've seen DKA rates uh, of maybe 3 or 4% compared to much lower rates in placebo, which tells us something a little bit about the fact that the patients in the trials are actually looking after themselves a lot better than a lot of the patients in the real world. So my concern here is what would the rates of DK be if you started to use these drugs in the real world and how can you mitigate against that? Um, and there have been suggestions that we might do that uh, by perhaps asking patients to do uh, regular ketone monitoring, particularly if they're unwell. But of course that would increase the cost of using one of these uh, drugs in type 1 diabetes. Finally, I think the thing that might be a game changer here is the fascinating data that suggests that these drugs might be renoprotective and of course that the cardioprotective effects that we've seen in type 2 diabetes might also be uh, there in type 2 diabetes. And I think if in the long term we were able to demonstrate those benefits and they were really uh, actually realised for patients with type 1 diabetes, that might shift the risk-benefit ratio in a way that would make it favourable to use these drugs in type 1 diabetes. But at the moment, I think it would be a very small group of patients who are very well able to monitor their ketones, look after their diabetes well, who would really benefit from these drugs. And even then, uh, there is always this lingering concern around ketoacidosis.